So briefly, I'll be talking about what keeps retina attached, what are the cellular effects of regmatogenous retinal detachment, what do you mean by regma or the break, the diagnosis, management, complications, and conclusions. Retinal detachment, we know, is a separation of the neurosensory retina from the retinal pigmentary epithelium. But if you go back into the embryology a little bit, then we realize that this is actually a space, a physical space which is present in the embryologically developing eye, which is in the primordial optic vesicle, which was actually the central space. The red line indicates the area which is uh, going to develop into the neurosensory retina, and the green line indicates the area of the optic vesicle which develops into retinal pigment epithelium. The space in between is what is ultimately compressed into the potential space which gets opened up in the process of regmatogenous retinal detachment. Just briefly about the embryological significance. What are the factors that normally keep the retina in its place attached to the retinal pigment epithelium? These are multiple factors, some mechanical, some biochemical, etc. Briefly, the vitreous is supposed to play an important role because the intact gel vitreous has a mechanical tamponading effect on the retina. However, we find that removal of the vitreous does not necessarily detach the retina. So obviously there are other factors in play that keep the retina attached. In the presence of a retinal hole, an intact gel can tampon out the break, while the same hole in the presence of vitreous synergesis or posterior vitreous detachment can lead to higher tendency for retinal detachment. We also understand that non-regmatogenous retinal detachment can occur even when the gel vitreous is still intact and adherent to the retina, telling us that the attachment of vitreous to the retina is just one of the factors that keeps the retina attached. People who do scleral buckling procedures also realize that in the presence of a gel vitreous which is intact, a buckle works better than you don't need to do vitreous surgery because you basically indent the eyewall into the vitreous gel. Fluid pressure also is an important factor that keeps the retina attached. This is both osmotic and hydrostatic. It drives the fluid normally passively from the vitreous to the choroid at the rate of about 12 millimeters per mercury. That is the pressure applied by the fluid that is passively aggressing from the vitreous to the choroid. The normal resistance to the flow by the retina and RPE helps to keep the retina pushed against the RPE. But we also find that once you seal a break under abnormal conditions, the RPE is able to actually pump the fluid at the rate of nearly 0.3 microliters per hour per square millimeter, which means almost 3 to 4 ml of fluid can be evacuated in a matter of one day, which is why even in the non-drainage procedures, when you seal the hole, by next day the retina remains attached because of the RPE pump. There are also mechanical forces in the subretinal space. We know that mechanically there's interdigitation between RPE microvilli and the tips of the outer segment of the photoreceptors. If we see the pictures on the right side, here are the photoreceptors and the RPE cells interdigitating. The electron microscopy picture even more beautifully demonstrates the presence of the shearing by the microvilli around the uh, photoreceptor outer segments. There are electrostatic forces that oppose the separation of these two membranes. There is also presence of inter-photoreceptor matrix that fills the space between the RPE cells, microvilli, and the photoreceptors. This has a glue-like effect, and this is mediated through receptors that bind to the components of the inter-photoreceptor matrix. The metabolic forces possibly act by modulating the fluid absorption by the retinal pigment epithelium because we do know that if you administer mannitol or acetazolamide or even freeze the eyeball, it can increase the retinal adhesion. The flip side is if you inject a hyperosmotic agent like urea in the vitreous, it can loosen the adhesions. So there are metabolic forces also acting to keep the retina in its place. What happens when the retina is detached? There are effects on the cells of both retinal pigment epithelium 
as well as the outer photoreceptors as well as the entire uh, uh, composition of the retinal structure is affected by the act of retina getting detached. The first thing that happens is an alteration of the RPE apical surface. It leads also to the RPE cells becoming loose, they proliferate and they migrate from where they are supposed to be located, which is on the Brux membrane. It also leads to degeneration of the photoreceptor outer segments. The subretinal space gets filled up with polymorpho, uh, polymorphonuclear leukocyte, leukocytes, monocytes, macrophages, free RPE cells, and outer segment fragments. The inner segment, which is, if you see the photoreceptor uh, anatomy, which is depicted to the right of you this slide, you can see that this part is the photoreceptor outer segment, which interregitates with the RPE cell. And this part is the inner segment, which contains the ellipsoid zone that contains mitochondria, and the myoid zone, which contains the Golgi bodies. And this is the cells of the photoreceptor which are present in the outer nuclear layer. So the maximum effect is seen on the inner segment, wherein there is swelling, disruption, and loss of the mitochondria in the ellipsoid zone, and disruption of the Golgi bodies in the myoid zone. The connecting filament, which is here, that is the cilium, which connects the outer segment to the inner segment, is retained well. The cone outer segment protein production stops one week after retinal detachment occurs, and the photoreceptor cells undergo apoptosis when the retinal detachment persists. The cell death and extrusion of cell bodies into subretinal space then takes place. There is also effect on the rod bipolar cells. These bipolar cells, you know that this area contains the inner nuclear layer, which contains the cell bodies of all other cells, which is amacrine cells, bipolar cells, horizontal cells, etc. And these process, the cell processes, they grow now beyond the photoreceptor layer into the subretinal space somewhere here. The ganglion cells, which are here, they express, again, growth associated protein, which is not expressed normally in an attached state. The non-neuronal cells, such as astrocytes, neural cells, pericytes, capillary endothelial cells, and microglia, all show sign of proliferation, which is not there in the normal attached state. The Mueller cell processes also express by maintaining CD44, and they can reach the subretinal space and grow on the photoreceptor surface, which is why you get the subretinal gliosis as a reaction to chronic retinal detachment. What happens when you reattach the retina? The trigger for PVR process may persist even after reattachment of retina. The recovery involves redifferentiation of the surface of RP cells. There is establishment of contact between RPE cells and photoreceptors, but this contact is not made permanent immediately. It takes a long while before they can become totally normalized. That is, the balance between photoreceptor disc addition and shedding is not brought about immediately when you reattach the retina. The process may take months or even years to stabilize. So, it is in brief about what happens histologically when the retina is attached or detached. The types of detachment of retina are regmatogenous, broadly speaking, traction combined mechanism, and exudative or secondary detachment. A word about regma or retinal break, it is gone in who first identified that retinal detachment is associated with the retinal break. People thought initially that it is the retinal detachment which caused the break, but it's gone in who showed that it is a break which caused the retinal detachment and not the other way around. Now, retinal break is nothing but a dehiscence in the continuity of retina. This can be caused by a retinal tear, wherein there is a tractional force which is tearing off the retina, or it could be caused by atrophy of the retina, which lead to dehiscence occurring within, for example, a lattice degeneration. An operculated retinal hole started off as a retinal tear, but since the entire retina flap is torn away, there is no more persisting traction on the hole. That's called operculated retinal hole. You also get um, more understanding as to where this regma can form. When the vitreous detaches, at the posterior vitreous base, retinal tears can form because the vitreous base, posterior vitreous base, 
is not always a smooth continuous line. It can be irregular and where it is protruding a little posteriorly, it can tear the retina and cause a retinal tear. It also can occur at the edge of strong attachments such as chororetinal scars, edge of a lattice degeneration where also the vitreous is strongly attached to the retina at the edge of the lattice. Along major blood vessels, it can be strongly attached and can tear and hence cause vitreous hemorrhage along with the retinal tear. In necrotic areas of infectious retinitis, the retina itself is necrotic, so it easily tears. You also get in retinoschisis breaks both in the inner and outer retinal layer. The reason why I listed all these separately is because the appearance, the mechanism is slightly different in each one of these entities that all cause retinal dehiscence. The posterior pole selectively can have retinal breaks. As you can see in high myopia, wherein there is a staphyloma, you can get small chinks of breaks along the retinal bed vessels because the retina is extremely thin and atrophic. You can get a macular hole, not just in high myopia, but even in idiopathic uh, cases. And you can get holes or atrophic areas in myopia, especially in the staphylomatous areas. This picture shows you a few of the retinal tears. If you see the picture here, to the down and left of the uh, left eye, you can see the horseshoe tear or U-shaped tear as it is called. You can see the tag of the tear flap is pointing posteriorly because the vitreous is pulling the retina from posterior to anteriorly. So you get a flap of this variety, which is narrow posteriorly and broader anteriorly in the flap. You also see in the same picture, lattice degeneration here with atrophic holes within the lattice. In the other eye, you see again a horseshoe tear at the vitreous base, which is seen right near the ora serrata. A word about giant retinal tears is a word you use to describe a retinal tear of more than 90 degrees circumference because it has got a special place in the way you manage these giant tear related detachments. Again, to differentiate between a giant retinal tear and a dialysis is very crucial because it reflects on how you manage them. A giant retinal tear is occurring at the posterior vitreous base, which means the vitreous is adherent to the anterior torn flap. As you can see here, this is the anterior torn flap to which the vitreous base is adherent. So much so that the posterior retina is free of the vitreous. But vitreous gel can go into subretinal space and push this retinal tear posteriorly. Or subretinal space can also be filled with subretinal fluid from a synaritic vitreous. You can see the vitreous detachment here with the floating uh, posterior hyaloid phase. In contrast, in a giant retinal dialysis, the split is occurring at the ora serrata when the vitreous is still probably attached, like in a blunt trauma. So to start with, PVD is absent. Hence, it's the intra-basal, means within the vitreous base split of the retina right at the ora serrata. And hence, these detachments are very slowly progressive since there's no enough liquid vitreous available for a rapid onset detachment. Most patients with retinal detachment present with symptoms of flashes, floaters, which actually signify the occurrence of retinal tear itself, which produces a little bit of bleeding and cause floaters. Flashes are non-specific. You can have flashes without retinal tear and tear without flashes as well. But a shadow or a screen in front of the eye is probably the earliest of symptoms of retinal detachment. But patients can remain asymptomatic, especially when you find there's a localized retinal detachment in the periphery, which does not affect their central vision. With both eyes open, they may not be aware of the detachment. If retinal detachment occurs in an amblyopic eye, an already poor vision, patient may not be aware of the added loss of vision due to the detachment because the person probably is not using the tie properly. Again, a retinal detachment occurring in young children or mentally challenged patients will go unrecognized unless you do a routine examination of these patients. Now, coming to management. The first thing in management is you must be sure of what you're dealing with. Is it really a retinal detachment? Because there are conditions which can mimic retinal detachment and can be confusing, sometimes even to an experienced person. But the commonly 
mixed up conditions are retinoschisis, traumatic Berlin's edema, choroidal detachment as not uncommonly seen post glaucoma filtering surgery or sometimes even after a post cataract surgery, thick vitreous membranes or altered blood which has become uh, like a chicken fat yellowish in color can sometimes mimic retinal detachment especially for a beginner or a novice. The pictures to the right show is, shows you the top a typical retinal detachment. In this picture you can see the corrugated appearance of the retina which is rather typical of a regmatogenous retinal detachment. The second picture shows you retinoschisis. You can see up to here the border of the retinoschisis. It will be more smooth contour cystic kind of swelling in contrast to this kind of a corrugated undulating retinal detachment. This picture here also shows you retinoschisis. It also shows in addition two outer retinal layer breaks. You can actually trace the blood vessels on top of these so-called breaks telling you that the breaks are of the outer retinal layer not the inner retinal layer. The picture here shows you a combination of choroidal detachment and retinal detachment. You can see the corrugated retinal detachment here and here and a choroidal detachment here which is a brownish swelling. Once you know it is indeed retinal detachment, then you have to question yourself, is it regmatogenous retinal detachment or any of the other conditions like fractional detachment and secondary detachment. It can be confusing also in situations such as post-inflammatory exudative RD or RD secondary to tumors and uveal effusion syndromes. It can be confusing and you should also understand that there can be combination of the factors means in a post-inflammatory case there could be traction caused by the vitreous condensation that could result in retinal break and cause a retinal detachment and hence it cannot be confused which should not be confused with exudative RD and kept on being treated with steroids when what it needs is a surgical management. Likewise tumors such as angiomatosis retinae can lead to secondary fibrosis and that can lead to a retinal break and a retinal detachment, a regmatogenous retinal detachment. This is just a slide which compares uh, in brief about features between regmatogenous retinal detachment, fractional retinal detachment and exudative RD. If you see the retinal configuration, regmatogenous retinal detachment is convex towards the observer. While fractional detachment is concave towards the observer because the primary force is something which is pulling the retina while in the regmatogenous detachment the primary force is the fluid that is going under the retina and lifting it up. Exudative RD is again convex towards observer. The margins of the detachment in regmatogenous retinal detachment most often are ill-defined because it is rapidly spreading. So there is a, a, a border which is a gray area wherein the fluid is just starting to accumulate. So the, the definition of the margin is not clear. While in a tractional detachment is very often a well-defined margin. Exudative RD is also having ill-defined margin plus you get also the shifting fluid in exudative RD which is characteristic. Shifting fluid is not usually seen in regmatogenous RD but on occasions some chronic detachments can have shifting fluid even in regmatogenous RD while TRD almost never has shifting fluid. Retinal breaks if present and if identified almost always point towards RRD but not being able to identify retinal break does not mean it is not a regular retinal attachment. The retinal undulations are characteristic of acute RD, but a very chronic RD need not have these undulations because these undulations are caused by retinal edema, which occurs in acute RD. But once the edema wears off and the outer retinal layers no longer have those characteristic undulations, the retina may be very smooth and transparent rather than being semi-opaque or opalescent. You get pigment in the anterior vitreous called Schaffer sign because RP is able to migrate into the anterior vitreous cavity. However, you can also get pigment in case of uveitis because of liberation of pigment from the iris and ciliary body which can spill over into the vitreous cavity. There are other features like PVR in RRD and in TRD you get the preretinal traction in the form of fibrosis caused by some tissue like diabetic proliferative vascular retinopathy or BRVO or CRVO etc. In the exudative RD, you may find evidence of tumor or uveitis, which guide you towards the diagnosis. 
So now we know it is, we are dealing with recombinogenous retinal detachment. What is the next step? Before you manage, we should locate all the breaks because the aim is to treat all the breaks. To guide us, Harvey Linkoff has come out with certain rules. You should understand these are general rules, but not a 100% foolproof guarantee that you will identify the break according to these rules always. What they tell you is that if you find a superior temporal or nasal detachment, in more than 98% of the cases, the primary break is lying within 1.5 clock hours of the highest border. These pictures, unfortunately, are not drawn to the usual color coding. The brown part is actually a detached retina and the blue part is actually attached retina. If you find the detachment is extending, upper border is here and lower border is here. So within one and a half clock hours of the upper border, 98% of the times you will find a retinal break. It is a total detachment or superior detachment that crosses the 12 o'clock meridian here. Then you will find in 93% of the cases, the break lies in this triangle with its apex at the ora serrata and the sites interacting the equator at one o'clock and 12, um, on either side of 12 o'clock, one clock hour. So in this triangle, you'll find the break. In the inferior detachments, the 95% of the breaks lie towards the side where the retinal detachment is higher. Now with these clues, you try to identify the retinal breaks in all the cases. And as I said, don't be happy with identifying one break, examine and identify all the breaks. So you, for this purpose, you use binocular render tophonoscopy with clearer indentation and possibly do a nice detailed retinal drawing or take a picture with the optos, a wide angle picture. Now the approaches to fix the retina are broadly barrage laser, numerity retinopexy, scleral buckling, and a pars vitrectomy approach. Let me cover each one of these a little more in detail. Barrage laser is easily done in the clinic. It's applicable for localized retinal attachments of usually not more than four disc diameters in size. You may stretch it to little larger areas in selected cases such as very, very chronic RD with a very thin functionless retina and no visual potential in the area of RD you can, you're justified in just enlarging the adhesion by producing two rows of laser. Otherwise, in most cases, beyond four digit diameters in size, you tend to operate rather than do your barrage laser. And when you resort to barrage laser, since the break itself is not being treated, you should understand you cannot treat around the break with laser because there's fluid there. You are forced to treat beyond the area of the detachment. And once you treat beyond the area of detachment, the scotoma caused by the original detachment increases because of the two to three rows of laser. And because you are going more posteriorly than the detachment itself, the patient can be actually aware of the scotoma now if he or she is not aware of it before he started doing laser. So you must explain to the patient the reasons for doing the laser and the fact that they may be actually be obvious, more obvious of this scotoma after the laser. And sometimes if it cuts through the laser marks, you are forced to ultimately end up operating. Coming to pneumatic retinopexy, it was, although use of air or gas has been, use of air has been in vogue for a long time. Ohm is the first person who used air in almost 1990s, but it was George Hilton who popularized pneumatic retinopexy. The principle of pneumatic retinopexy against an outpatient kind of treatment does not involve any cutting and stitching. So it appeals to your common sense that if it can be done effectively and successfully, why not offer a relatively less invasive treatment? The principle is that you inject a bubble of gas, a expansile gas bubble, means full concentration C3F8 or SF6, and the gas has a buoyancy, so it floats up. So if you keep the retinal break at the most non-dependent position, the break is likely to bridge the break the break is likely to be bridged by the expanded gas bubble, so much so that due to the surface tension, it does not permit fluid to enter the subretinal space and whatever fluid is already there gets absorbed by the RPE pump. And later you can do laser once the retina gets reattached or before itself you can treat that area with cryotherapy. So this is the basic principle of pneumatic retinopexy. The indications are that 
when the retinal breaks are one or more within one clock hour, that is around 30 degrees, located in the upper eight clock hours of the fundus, because the gas has to float up, it cannot tamper or anything within the lower four clock hours, even in the best posturing, unless you make the patient hang down the head from the clock from the bed, which is a impossibly impossible position for any patient to adopt. There should be no PVR and you should be able to 100% exclude other retinal breaks because if there's a haze in media, little bit of vitreous hemorrhage, little bit of cataract, and you're not able to exclude other retinal breaks, you perhaps should not do pneumatic retinopexy. So technique is either you do cryo before gas injection or you do laser after, one day after the retina is reattached. Through pars we inject 0.5 cc of SF6 or 0.3 cc of C3F8. Parasensis may be done if required. And we educate the patient on the correct posturing. Easiest is to put an iPad and draw an arrow mark on the iPad so that ask him to keep the arrow upright so that the gas is right over the break. Where macula is still attached, if we inject, like in the case, in the pictures drawn below, if the macula is attached here, if we inject a gas bubble now, the gas will float up and push the retinal detachment down and actually detach the macula if you don't take precautions. Then you don't want to detach an attached macula. So what you do is you inject a gas bubble and put them quickly prone so that the gas migrates over the optic disc. And then slowly lift the head up so that you steamroll the fluid up towards the fluid so the fluid gets squeezed into the vitreous cavity and there's no longer fluid in the subretinal space to detach the macula. And that is called steamroller technique. Like any other procedure, this also can be complicated. The gas can be in the wrong place. It can be trapped in the petite space. You know what is petite space? The space between the anterior hyoid and the posterior zonules of the lens. So it forms like a donut around the lens and hence it is totally ineffective. It can't, doesn't cause harm, maybe a cataract early, but doesn't cause any harm, but it's totally useless because it cannot tamper out the break. The reason why it's occurred is because your needle has not penetrated into the vitreous gel. Or most of the gas could have leaked out of the eye into subcongenital space because you didn't take the precaution of occluding the aperture of the sclera by using a cotton bud. Or the gas can go into subretinal space if the break is very large, or if the gas bubble has become such fragmented small bubbles it migrate into subretinal space. If subretinal gas needs a vitreoretinal surgery to remove it, there's no other way you can get rid of it. Secondary glaucoma can occur if somebody has got already a compromised aqueous outflow facility. So it's important that we should not use it in patients with glaucoma. And as I said, macular detachment can occur in eyes with attached macula. Why does pneumatic retinopexy fail? It's not complication of surgery of the procedure. But it's a failure to keep the retina attached. It's because mostly it's a wrong choice of the case. Breaks have been missed, or there are medial opacities, obscured parts of the fundus. Relatively large series of breaks, you couldn't judge that gas can actually migrate into subretinal space through this break, or due to inability of the patient to posture properly. So you should obviously ask the patient whether he or she can posture after the treatment. And a poor technique where you didn't adequately penetrate the vitreous gel before injecting the fluid, the gas bubble. Or very rarely, it's caused by new breaks forming because the gas is pushing the vitreous gel up. So theoretically, a break can form elsewhere because there's vitreous traction. Coming to scleral buckling, the most common procedure performed for simple regmatogenous retinal detachment. It was Ernst Custodis who first uh, applied this procedure of buckling or indenting the sclera inwards into the vitreous gel so that the break is caught between the vitreous gel and the indented sclera and hence gets opposed. But it was Charles Keepens who really uh, modified and uh, enlarged the scope of scleral buckling by inventing a plethora of scleral buckling materials, solid silicon and solid silicon sponges, the encircling bands, 240, 40 band, the claw hitch knot, the tantalum clips, etc., etc or what's case sleeves, etc. So broadly, scleral buckling can be divided into four major steps. I'm not going to the details of the surgical procedure. For that, you need to watch somebody performing it. 
or watch a YouTube video, but broadly it can be fragmented into four major steps. One is localization of the break or breaks, then creating a situation where the retina gets permanently adherent to the RPE by irritating both surfaces using cryopixy. Place a buckle with or without a band to indent the eyewall towards the break and then manage the subretinal fluid. Means you may drain the fluid, you may not, depending upon individual case. So what do we localize? If you find a picture like the one to the left with a single small horseshoe tear, as the arrow is depicting, you just localize the posterior lip tip of the horseshoe tear. That is enough. Because the whole break is doesn't occupy much of a space. You can place a buckle corresponding to the located scleral mark. If the break is large, like the picture here, you localize the lateral horns in addition to the posterior tip of the break. If there are multiple breaks. You mark the two lateral extreme breaks first and then the posterior most point of the breaks so that you actually aim to cover all these breaks by a single buckle. If the breaks are in two different quadrants, then you aim for two different buckles, one here and one here. So you localize correspondingly the four points. For a lattice degeneration, you mark the two ends of the lattice and localizing the posterior most point may not be very important because most lattices are very narrow strips. But if the lattices are like this, then you mark one mark point here, one point here, one point here, so that you can cover the entire area with a good buckle. There can be errors in localization, like a highly elevated detachment produces parallax issues. As you can see in this picture, if this point is highly elevated like here, the, the indentation doesn't correspond to the break. So you can have parallax, you may localize it too far posteriorly because you're looking at this point rather than at this point. Localizing under muscles could also be difficult sometimes. And there's also confusion caused by the indentation caused by the shaft versus tip of the instrument. Easiest way to know whether your the indentation caused in the fundus is caused by the tip of the instrument or by the shaft is by pushing the instrument anterior posteriorly in its axis. If the indentation is caused by the tip of the instrument, it will move, the indentation also moves anterior posteriorly. But if it's caused by the shaft, it doesn't move. The order or sequence of steps may be different depending upon the sequence that you follow. The usual sequence we follow is, first we apply cryotherapy, means you localize the breaks, then we freeze the edges of the cryo of the lesions to be frozen, which is the lattice or retinal breaks. You try to avoid freezing the bare retinal pigmentophilia. Then you place an explant. Then you decide whether it requires drainage if the fluid is too much. And after you drain, you may inject air to form the eye eyeball if the eye is very soft or inject saline. While there's a, another technique which is adopted mainly by Europeans is called DAS technique. It is first you drain then you inject air so that the eye is not soft. Then you apply cryo and last you place explant. There are advantages for this DS technique. By draining first, the localization of lesions is, lesions is very apt and precise because the retina is already flat. You also drain in a non cryo treated area because drainage is done right in the beginning of the surgery. While in the first sequence, cryo is done first so that the whole choroid is now dilate, having co dilated choroidal vessels. So that when you drain, there's a greater risk of subretinal bleed occurring. While in the DS technique, the risk of subretinal bleed is less. But there are disadvantages of draining first. The hypotony has to be immediately addressed because there is no buckle in place to quickly tighten to form the eyeball. So you may have to inject air to form the eye. But this air can get fragmented and can impede view of the fundus making it difficult to do cryo and lock laser break. So you must aim to get one single intravitreal air bubble when you do DS technique. What are the complications of scleral buckling? They can be broadly divided into intraoperative, early postoperative, and late postoperative. 
Intraoperative complications can begin. It's impossible to go into the details broadly. Accidental damage to the muscle and vertex veins, accidental globe perforation while passing sutures to uh, fix these apex plant, inaccurate localization of breaks, so the buckle break relationship is not accurate, is altered, and hence the break is not well supported, leading to recurrence of detachment. Drainage related complications, which could be a dry tap because you chose the wrong location for drainage where there's no fluid or little fluid. There can be subretinal hemorrhage, which can migrate under the macula. Retina may get incarcerated. Retina can get perforated. And hypotony related complications, such as choroidal detachment or suprachoroidal hemorrhage. You can get fish mouthing, as you can see in the picture to your right. This is the retinal break. The break buckle is beautifully placed, but this fish mouthing is communicating with the fluid posterior to the break. The easiest way to manage this is just bring it to a bubble of air and position him to the right lateral position. Then the fluid flatters this fold and cuts off the communication. Recurrent retinal attachment can be due to new retinal breaks or a reopened old break due to vitreous traction and PVR. In the early postoperative period, you can get serious coral detachments, hemorrhage coral detachments, secondary glaucoma, anti-segment ischemia. Again, it's not possible for me to go into the details, but a word about secondary glaucoma. You can get secondary glaucoma because of minimal coral detachment also, which pushes the entire iris uh, lens diaphragm forwards. So any eye with a little shallow anti-chamber can develop even an angle closure glaucoma, not just open angle type glaucoma due to steroid usage. Anti-segment ischemia, is less of a problem when you handle less muscles and not put very broad buckles and you handle the muscles very carefully. Muscle disinsertion, which was often associated with anti-segment ischemia, is no longer practiced as a part of surgical procedure because any eye which requires disinsertion of muscle and very broad buckles is now handled with parsplenovitrectomy procedure. Late complication of scleral buckling could be buckle related, such as exposed buckle, intruding buckle, are infected buckle, strabismus or motility restrictions. There are also relatively unimportant side effects such as induced myopia because of the constricting effort of encephalage, foveal displacement. This has been beautifully brought out by the usage of uh, uh, autofluorescence testing, wherein the shadow caused by the original blood vessels can be still identified at the RPE level by autofluorescence. And now there's a mismatch between where the retina has fallen back and the original shadow caused by the same blood vessels. Just telling you that the fovea need not fall back exactly at the same place where it was originally present before detachment. Hence the importance of operating on ice before fovea gets detached. Some degree of enough almost can occur because of the orbital fat atrophy that invariably is accompanies a orbital management with uh, um, opening up of the orbit and handling of the extracular muscles. Now, the last approach that I will discuss with you is a parsplenar vitrectomy approach for managing simple retinal detachments. Again, I'm emphasizing simple retinal detachment because it is indeed the approach that we use for complex retinal detachments. But in simple retinal detachments, especially suited in this bullous retinal detachment where sometimes the breaks may not be obvious. In pseudofake eyes, again, it is the best way of managing because um, the lens is not there to become opaque. And you can actually do a very good vitrectomy, thorough vitrectomy, because it's a pseudofake eye. In highly myopic eyes also, it's a useful technique because in highly myopic eyes, very often there are tiny breaks in the posterior pole, which could easily be missed. And the breaks are very posterior to be buckled in highly myopic eye because the eyeball itself is very large and enlarged. In eyes with lattice-related retinal attachments, and dialysis related retinal attachment, we still prefer to do scleral bucklings because these are eyes with detachments occurring in younger people where the lens is clear and you don't want to operate on those eyes uh, by vitrectomy, which causes early cataract. Plus, the vitreous is not detached in most of these cases, and hence, buckling is an easier technique to adopt. As I already alluded to you, parsplenar vitrectomy is the only way to do for cases with more complex problems such as giant retinal tears, macular holes, posterior retinal tears, 
residual attachment with vitreous hemorrhage, PVR, etc., etc. That is outside the scope of this presentation. It's just a video which shows you. Uh, not sure the video plays. It doesn't play as it was. Yeah. Okay. It's just to show you a simple retinal detachment how it can be so elegantly managed by a partial vitrectomy route. When in, after doing the vitrectomy with a 25 gauge vitrectomy using three tiny ports, conjunctiva itself is not open. You just do a vitrectomy, then you inject peripheral carbon liquid if you if you require to, because the break is very anterior. In this case, I use peripheral carbon liquid so that I can drain through the peripheral break and not create a posterior anatomy. Then you do. This is the fluid fluid gas exchange being done. The retinal break is being used to remove some retinal fluid. And uh, you allow air to go in and replace both the vitreous fluid as well as remove the peripheral carbon liquid after, at the end of uh, flattening of the retina. In most cases, you may not need to even use peripheral carbon liquid. You can directly you do fluid air exchange and settle the retina. And once the retina is flattened, you treat it with laser and replace it with gas. Whether it is SF6 or C2F6 or C3F8 depends upon number of breaks and the inferior located, superior located, etc. It's so elegant because with three tiny breaks, uh, the sclerotomies, which don't even need suturing, the patient is cured and the trauma to the eye is least. There are other approaches which have been tried to fix a detached retina, such as balloon temporary buckle, which is totally gone out of work now. Supracoroidal buckle, which is again coming back into use for macular hole related detachments. Uh, the guy from Egypt has popularized supracoroidal buckle where they inject sodium hyaluronate into supracoroidal space using special catheters and produce a, a buckle under the macula hole. But for simple retinal attachment, which I am discussing, supracoroidal buckle is not really used as a routine. So, coming to the good prognosticating factors. Obviously, a shorter duration of retinal attachment, attached status of macula, absence of other complicated issues such as GRT, macular holes, PVR, and absence of intraoperative complications all are associated with good prognosticating factors. But in general, if you get a fresh retinal attachment with none of the other complicating features which I have mentioned present, 90% should be fixed with one surgery. That should be your success rate, your goal of getting a reattachment of retina. <coughs> so in conclusion, dear friends, retinal attachment is the separation of neurosensory retina from retinal pigment epithelium. Regmatogenous retinal attachment is caused by the presence of one or more breaks. A fresh retinal attachment has a very typical appearance with corrugation that is rather diagnostic, even if the break is not obviously visible. Finding and closing all the retinal breaks is vital for the success of surgery. Scleral buckling is an external approach which is aimed at indenting the eye wall into the vitreous, thus sandwiching the break between the vitreous gel and the indented eye wall and hence closing the break. The break is permanently sealed off by using either cryopexy or laser. While vitrectomy and pneumatic retinopexy are internal approaches, aimed at removing the vitreous gel or just pushing the retina against the eye wall using a gas bubble. Pneumatic retinopexy is successful in selected cases. It's a case selection which is very, very vital for the success of pneumatic retinopexy. A past plan of vitrectomy approach is more and more preferred now over scleral buckling, even for fresh retinal attachment. But as I mentioned, even in those die-hard vitrectomy surgeons who don't want to do scleral buckling, I would still advocate that they should do scleral buckling as a first treatment of choice for retinal detachment secondary to lattice related atrophic holes leading to chronic detachments in young people or retinal dialysis related retinal detachment again in the absence of PVR etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Not all lattice degeneration related detachments are caused by atrophic holes. They can be caused by PVD which causes a tear at the edge of lattice then of course the treatment would be again a passman approach if required. But if it is caused only by atrophic holes, then I would choose still a scleral buckling. Thank you very much for your hearing.